Okay, everyone, I think we'll begin now. Uh, welcome to the Jewish Study Center. I'm Jerry Garfinkel. I am the treasurer of the Jewish Study Center. And as such, I need to tell you that our classes are all free. Our instructors are all very knowledgeable and people love our classes, but we do have some expenses. And so we encourage, but we don't require it all. We do encourage donations. If you want to donate, go to our website, www.jewishstudycenter.org and click on donate. And then you have a choice. You can donate from your uh, PayPal account or uh, via a, a credit card or a check. And if you say you want to donate by check, it'll give you the address and where to send it. Uh, a few technical points now, as you must realize, this is being recorded. And after the class is over, I'm going to delete the part of the recording that begins before the class actually began. And I will post it on YouTube and then send an email to everyone who's registered uh, on where the recording is. Also, I've put on the uh, closed captions so you can see the words go by. Uh, it's fairly accurate for, for English. And um, everybody will be muted until the end of the presentation. We do want your comments and your questions. So put your comments and or questions in the chat box. Address it to everybody. Because sometimes you make a comment, someone will comment on your comment, et cetera, et cetera. So address it to everyone. And after uh, Leo's uh, presentation, there'll be a Q&A session. And uh, then some of your questions will be, will be uh, addressed. Um, so at this point, I want to introduce our Vice President, Mindy Reiser. And she'll be in charge of both the Q&A uh, session and also she'll introduce today's uh, speaker. You're, you're on. Okay, well, welcome everyone. We're delighted you're spending a part of your evening tonight. And I am particularly delighted to introduce Lior Sternfeld, who is an associate professor of history and Jewish studies at Pennsylvania State University in the United States. He is a social historian of the modern Middle East with particular interests in the histories of the Jewish people and other minorities in the region. Against the backdrop of Iranian nationalism, Zionism, and constitutionalism, his first book uh, is titled Between Iran and Zion, Jewish Histories of 20th Century Iran. And that was published just a few years ago, 2018, by Stanford University Press. The book examined the development and integration of Jewish communities in Iran into the nation building projects of the last century. Professor Sternfeld is not speaking from the United States. He is teaching this semester at the Ludwig Maximilian Universität in Munich, Germany, and he will be speaking to us right now from Munich, where it is about seven minutes after one o'clock in the morning on Friday, June 16th. So, Lior, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Mindy and Jerry, for um, for the invitation, for organizing this lecture. And thank you all for uh, for joining. Um, yes, it is 1.08 a.m. right now. So I took a double espresso and I hope that it will <laughs> keep me going to the end of the <laughs> to the end of the talk. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, yeah. Do you see the PowerPoint right now? Um, yes, we see it. Yeah, good. All right. So um, 
Today, we are going to talk about uh, the Iranian Jewish community in Iran, in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, I'm, as, as Mindy said, I'm a historian of, of modern Iran, of the modern Middle East. I studied the Jews of Iran. Um, my first book is uh, Between Iran and Zion, and most of the most of the uh, of the photos that you're going to see in today's presentation are taken from the uh, from the photographic chronicle that uh, I just recently published with uh, the Iranian photographer uh, Hassan Sabakhshian and uh, the Iranian journalist uh, Parvaneva Hidmanash. Um, and also you got a discount code on the registration email. Um, but this is where I stop the promotions. <laughs> um, so before we get to uh, the Islamic Republic, um, I want to give you a broad overview of what happened, you know, what was the condition, the situation of Iranian Jews um, in, the, in the 20th century, before the revolution. So the number of Iranian Jews before the revolution was about 100,000. It was very different from other countries in the Middle East that started to see their communities uh, vanish after, you know, uh, after gradually after 1948. Um, in fact, Iran was the only country in the Middle East that saw its Jewish population grow under, uh, after 1948. Um, there was wave of migration of Iraqi Jews to Iran, um, and then additional Jews came from uh, India, Pakistan, um, and, and even from Afghanistan. Um, so throughout most of the century, we're talking about population of 100,000. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, the majority of them, about 60,000 of them, lived in uh, in Tehran, in the capital, and uh, in other um, big cities. I see that I uh, I made typo. It's not Shira, which is my daughter's name. It's Shiraz, <laughs> the city, um, Isfahan, Yazd, and Abadan. Um, in the 20th century, uh, the they Jewish communities underwent tremendous transformation. In the 1940s, uh, about 80% of the Jews belonged to the impoverished uh, lower classes. Um, in 1977, we have a survey that was conducted by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee and found that 80% of the Jews in Iran were middle and upper middle classes. And this is in the span of less than four decades. Um, they were highly integrated in the Iranian society, overrepresented in the medical fields, in higher education, in journalism. Um, so, so they were, you know, they were, they were less than half of percentage uh, of the population, but they were overrepresented, especially in in in, in the big cities. Um, and also, this is another thing um, that we usually don't think about. A good number of of the Jewish uh, communities um, supported or were sympathetic to the revolution in 1978, 1979. This is something that I wrote about uh, extensively. Um, and in the elections in 1978, in March, 1978, elections for the leadership of the community, um, a group of young revolutionaries won the, the elections. So, in a way, the Jewish community revolutionized itself before the country did. And uh, and one more interesting thing before we move to the post-revolutionary period. After 1961, there was little to no Aliyah from, uh, from Iran to Israel. Um, after 
the only time that we can mark a wave of, of Aliyah, of migration to Israel, is between 48 to 53. Uh, the numbers after 1953 uh, shrunk rapidly. And after 1961, there was virtually no uh, migration from uh, from Iran to Israel, to the extent that the Aliyah Department and the Jewish Agency issued a memo and they said uh, we should stop wasting our money and try to uh, to make Iranian Jews come. We should now treat them as Jews in England, in Australia, and South Africa. They are very happy where they live. They feel safe and secure, and they are not living. So this is something to keep in mind when we talk about the post-revolution. So in the immediate uh, decade after the revolution, we see mass migration of, of Jews, uh, mostly to the US. About 70% of, of outgoing migration left for the US and then uh, Israel and fewer to Europe. Um, in 2000, the community had about 35,000 members. Today, it is estimated uh, between to be between 10,000 and 25,000. And I think that uh, last summer, the chief rabbi of Iran uh, said in an interview that uh, there are, based on uh, community registration, uh, synagogues and schools, there are about 15,000 uh, Jews in Iran. And I think that this is a good guess. And now getting to the core of my talk, uh, there is a lot of misinformation about Jews of Iran, uh, Jews of Iran today. And, um, and there are many reasons. Uh, first of all, there, is, uh, there are very few uh, reliable sources um, in the West and coming from Iran and in Israel. Um, there is a lot of mystery around it, and uh, and some, you know, and there's always this kind of sensation when uh, when we talk about Jews of Iran, and this is something that I want to dispel a little bit now. Um, this is uh, a kosher restaurant in Isfahan. <laughs> um, just you know, I, I'm I'm going to show you contemporary life in Iran. So I think that starting with food is, uh, is probably a good, a good, uh, a good beginning. Um, when I talk about disinformation, um, what I really want to say is that we, we as Western audience are willing to buy anything that reaffirms our belief that Iran is not a rational place and that Iran is uh, inherently anti-Semitic. And therefore, when in 2006, when the Canadian National Post broke the story that uh, the parliament, the majlis, passed a law that requires Jews now to wear yellow badges, and we all know what it means, uh, it was taken without any, um, you know, without any criticism, without any reservation. It spread out rapidly. It, um, the U.S. condemned Iran for this move. Uh, the Israeli government said this is a sign that Iran is going uh, for a second Holocaust. Um, and it took a few days to understand that this was completely fabricated and there was nothing, uh, there was no substance whatsoever. The source of this uh, story came from um, diasporic opposition movement um, and, and later uh, all the news outlets uh, retracted this, uh, this item. Um, but surprisingly or not, the retraction did not get any any mention in, in the Israeli media. Um, so Israelis for, for months and years continue to think that there is this 
that there is some kind of law that requires uh, Jews to wear yellow badge. Um, this is, for example, um, the story from the Israeli uh, news outlet Ynet, which is the arguably the most popular outlet. And it says uh, yellow badge in Iran is a red light, red uh, red flag for the world. Um, and of course, Netanyahu that never missed an opportunity to uh, to provide Holocaust analogies said it's 1938 and Iran is Germany. Ahmadinejad uh, prepares for another Holocaust. And this is part of the effort. Uh, and by the way, the story, the Netanyahu uh, headline is is uh, is from later. So it's a few months after the the yellow badge uh, story broke. Um, now it's not always. You know, we don't have to go to the extreme of of Holocaust analogies. To, uh, to create a sensation about Iranian Jews. This is, for example, uh, from Surugim website, which is a news website that is, uh, is not uh, the most popular in Israel. It's, it's, very, it's identified with the religious nationalists. Um, but the headline here reads, watch, Imeshkachech Yerushalayim on Iranian soil. So, we get this uh, rare video of, uh, of Jews convening on Iranian soil and say, probably very quietly, I forget you, Jerusalem. Um, but uh, the attached video is of a wedding that took place uh, in 2020. Um, and we see Jews celebrating in the main synagogue in Tehran, in Yusuf Abad, which is a beautiful synagogue. Um, and it's, you know, it's taken from the Instagram account of the chief rabbi. So it's not very, <laughs> it's not something, it's not a, a intelligence uh, operation that uh, that brought this video to, uh, to the viewer's attention. Um, but, there is this title that the clickbait of um, watch, you have to watch this very rare moment of, of Jews saying Meshkachech on Iranian soil. Um, the headline of another Israeli um, daily newspaper last year, last summer, uh, was uh, the chief rabbi of Iran in a surprising uh, declaration we have freedom of religion. Um, so we can talk about what freedom of religion means and what can it mean? But I don't know why it's surprising if you follow, again, we, there are many possibilities for what freedom of religion can mean or what it can cover, but, uh, I doubt it. It merits this kind of um, this kind of headline. And just to show you that it's not something that Netanyahu started, uh, this is the headline from uh, the Var newspaper, which was uh, again one of the major newspapers in the until the 1980s. Uh, and this is fear of establishment of concentration camps for Jews in Iran. And this is from January 22nd, 1979. So it's just a week after the Shah left Iran and before Khomeini even came to Iran. Now, what, again, the, this, this news about concentration camps and always going to the Holocaust analogies, we, we start seeing that Iran in 1979 existed as, a, as an anomaly, right? It's not something, it's not a country that we can understand as a logical, uh, as a logical country, as, as, a, as, a, as something that we, that exists on, on, on our uh, normal understanding of countries and policies. 
Um, and we have protocols of various meetings of the government, but also it's Navon, the former president of Israel in 1979, um, he hosted uh, weekly meetings with uh, scholars. And he hosted uh, scholars who work on Iran and, uh, and there were few professors and few of the military intelligence there and a couple of politicians. And um, and we see that in the meetings, there are very interesting stories that come up, but it doesn't change the coverage. So for example, at the same time that these headlines, um, you know, create this panic regarding the Jews of Iran, the post-revolutionary constitution drafting committee sits in Tehran and one of the members is a Jewish lawyer, a political activist, his name was Aziz Daneshad, and he at the same time was proposing to eliminate the reserved seat for the minorities because now in the Islamic Republic, sorry, it was not yet the Islamic Republic, in the Iranian Republic, Jews will be able, Jews and Christians and Zoroastrians will be able to compete on nationalists and they won't need, they will not need a reserved seat in order to be represented. There's an, an interesting story about it, but if we have time, we can go back to it. Um, another thing that we discover is that uh, Jews don't want to come. Um, Menachem Begin, the prime minister, sent Moshe Katsav, who was then uh, a minister, young parliamentarian of Iranian origins, he sent him on a rescue mission to Iran and uh, with, uh, you know, open blank check to, uh, to bring all the Jews from Iran and, uh, and Moshe Katsav returned back to Jerusalem and reported that uh, they were not interested and they, and in the report that he submitted, he said, they told me that I'm welcome to stay and come to their synagogue and the community centers, but they asked me not to talk about uh, leaving Iran. Um, there was a newspaper that uh, started to be published. There is a long history of Jewish newspapers in Iran, but this one is from uh, the revolutionary period. It was called Tammuz after the Hebrew month, uh, and on this page we see letter from uh, the Iranian president at the time, Ali Khamenei, uh, today's supreme leader, congratulating uh, the Jewish community on, uh, I can't remember which holiday it was, but uh, the letter was uh, printed on the first page of the newspaper. This is the, uh, the publication that uh, still exist until today. It's called Ofek Bina, and it covers wide range of uh, of topics and um, um, stories from the Jewish world in Iran and outside Iran. In the most recent topic, uh, in the most recent issues, uh, they published a story on. Uh, two young uh, sisters that won third place in national championship of some kind of martial arts um, and uh, and discussion, very uh, thorough discussion on inheritance laws that uh, recently changed in favor of the Jews. Um, in the 1990s, in the reformist period, um, we saw that there was an attempt to bring the Jews closer to uh, to the Iranian society, and Khatami, President Khatami, uh, visited the synagogue uh, Yusuf Abad a couple of times, and he regularly met with uh, the Jewish leaders. Uh, this is him in the synagogue. Um, of course, uh, the most uh, volatile period was under Ahmadinejad 
and uh, and his Holocaust denial between 2005 and 2013. Um, and sometimes I hear, um, you know, people trying to, again, to make sense of the existence of Jewish community in Iran today. And they say, well, they cannot really speak their mind. They have to, uh, to hide their opinions. They have to... Uh, to satisfy uh, the government. And I think that the period of Ahmadinejad gave us very good uh, indication that we have to understand, first of all, that it's not easy to be an Iranian today. It's, not, it's even harder to be Iranian Jew in Iran today. But it doesn't mean that the Jewish community or any community in Iran uh, lost its voice or doesn't speak uh, when when they need to. And for example, during the the this endless saga of Holocaust denial, Harun Yeshayai, who is one of the leaders of the community, uh, wrote an article in in an Iranian newspaper, a general, not not a Jewish newspaper. And he, he accused the president of being ignorant, of, uh, of erasing Iran's history with regard to the Holocaust, because Iran was also uh, known um, to host refugees during the Holocaust. Uh, this is another story that I'm happy to discuss later if, if there's time. Um, and so this was one way of, um, you know, Jews speaking up during the, this period. And also Maurice Muatamad, who was the, uh, the Jewish representative in the Majlis at the time, in a very, uh, harsh critique, he gave a speech, uh, in the Majlis, in the presence of Ahmadinejad, and uh, and attacked him for uh, for the Holocaust denial and the damage that he's doing to the Jewish community and to Iran in general. Um, in during the period of Ahmadinejad, when everybody was happy to believe, you know, the stories about. Uh, the anti-Semitism of Iran, uh, and I, I feel that I always have to qualify it. It doesn't. I don't mean when I when I say it, I don't mean that there is no anti-Semitism in Iran. I'm, I'm just asking us to be more critical when we read the news. And there was a, a government plan in Israel to. Uh, this is a from the Mariv uh, Daily. Uh, to uh, to rescue uh, Iranian Jews, to bring them to Israel. Uh, later, they opened it up and uh, and said that it's Israel or the U.S. Um, they offered uh, five thousand dollars per person, so a family of five or six could get twenty five thirty thousand dollars, including benefits in. Uh, buying apartments and and after a few years uh, of operation, uh, pretty much zero families uh, took up on this offering. Um, and Israel um, ended this operation. So when. Hassan, the photographer, Parvane, and myself, when we embarked on this project of uh, organizing the, the, of producing the photography book, what we wanted to do is to normalize the Jewish existence in Iran. I, I, I don't know if normalize is the right word, but to, make it something that we, to overcome the shock of discovering that there is a Jewish community in Iran and then see what kind of life they have. And um, 
<laughs> excuse me. And this is what uh, what we're trying to show in this uh, in this book that there is a Jewish community that um, that has um, challenges and they have uh, regular life and they have uh, businesses and they have celebrations and ch and everything that in between. So the first photo is from a compound in Tehran that uh, that includes the house of the elderly and also a childcare facility. Um, this is um, the the ha the um, the building of the leadership of the Jewish community. Uh, this is where the uh, the council of the Jewish community meets and and um, respond to requests from the community. Uh, the Jewish representative in the Majlis uh, has an office there. Um, this is where they uh, they connect between the government and the Jewish community if needed. Uh, this is the leadership meeting, and we see here uh, Morris Muatamad, who was the Jewish representative in the Majlis um, uh, in the early to late uh, 2000s. And this is Siamak Morris Sedek, who was the representative from 2010 until uh, three years ago. Um, and other members of the leadership of the community. This is uh, Siamak Morris Sedek uh, giving a speech in the parliament. And Siamak Morris Sedek himself is a very interesting uh, person. Um, he, he is a physician. He served in the Iranian military uh, during the Iran Iraq War as part of, he was an army physician. He was in the front line, he was decorated uh, for his service. Um, he later became the, the director of the Jewish hospital in Tehran and then the representative in the Majlis. And his wife actually lives in, his wife and, and daughters live in the US. So he, he had the option to, to move to the US, but he, uh, he never took it. Um, this is outside uh, one of the synagogues, and uh, again, every synagogue is a compound with uh, with clubs and and classrooms. Um, and during the high holidays, they organize uh, food packages, not just for the those in need from the community, but also those in need from the neighborhood. And this is something that. Uh, is this is something that the community sees as as you know part of being of being there of being Iranian. It's not just to to take care of their own, but also to to show that they they care about the the community the the community of Iranians. There are Jewish schools in Iran, and there are Hebrew schools. Um, Hebrew schools operate on Friday, which is the day off in Iran. Um, and kids can uh, can learn Hebrew, they learn to read the Torah, they, uh, they have religious uh, education. Um, religious education is funded by the state for all religions all recognized religions, I'm not including uh, Baha'is, that are a very distinct uh, case of, uh, of religious minority. And in 2015, uh, the parliament passed a very uh, important law that the Jewish community had pushed for, for many years. And this was to exempt uh, Jewish students from attending public schools on Saturday. Uh, Saturday is a regular day uh, in in Iran, and uh, public schools start the week on sun on Saturday, and uh, and Jewish students were uh, had to report to school on Saturdays. And in 2015, the government passed a law 
that exempted Jews from attending schools on, on Saturday. This is uh, the classroom uh, in the religious, uh, in the Jewish religious school. Uh, we see on the left side, uh, the teacher explains about the tefillin and here on Tu Bishvat and explaining what is Tu Bishvat. And you can see that uh, Khomeini and Khamenei are uh, watching from uh, the top of the, of the wall to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Uh, kids, Jewish kids in the school, uh, getting ready to pick up the ball and go to the uh, schoolyard. Again, I, I, I think that there's, <laughs> there's something to be said about the presence of Khomeini and Khamenei in every corner. But, uh, um, Jewish holidays um, is something that is being celebrated uh, in the privacy of the homes, but also in the synagogues. Uh, this is Passover uh, in one of the families that uh, hosted Hassan and Parvane. Um, we see here some of the Iranian traditions of celebrating Passover which you see the cedar table is actually on the floor and there's a lot of green. And one of the, one of my favorite rituals of the Iranian cedar is during the Dayenu, uh, they hit one, one another with uh, green onions uh, to remember the bondage in Egypt. So. <laughs> um, the Jewish Charity Hospital in Tehran, named after Dr. Sapir, is one of the most beautiful places uh, in, in Tehran uh, for its history, not so much for the aesthetics, but for the history of the place. Uh, it was opened in, um, in 1941 when a Jewish physician named Ruhala Sapir, uh, he worked in a, in a state hospital and he saw a Jewish patient being treated very badly and, and um, because, because she was Jewish, and then he decided to open a hospital that would treat everyone uh, regardless of their religion or faith or any other uh, criteria. And it was opened first in, the, in a side room in a, in a synagogue and later moved to a bigger building. Uh, during World War II, uh, many Polish, there was a wave of, uh, of about three to 400,000 Polish refugees that came to Iran. Most of them were not Jewish. Uh, only 10% of them were Jewish, but um, many of them came in very bad health. And, uh, and they also brought a typhus to Iran. And Dr. Sapir got a typhus and died shortly after but his legacy survived uh, during the revolution. And this is, these are two of the images that are not from the book. Uh, during the revolution, this was the, the only hospital in Tehran that did not turn in uh, wounded protesters to the hands of the Savak, the secret police. Um, and there's a very heroic story there. Um, and a friend of mine who visited Tehran a few years ago knew that I'm, uh, that I'm very much interested in the hospital. So he took a photo of how the hospital looks today. And this is the image that we see here. Uh, this photo is from the hospital and we see a Jewish physician. Uh, today, uh, the hospital is in the old Jewish neighborhood in the 1960s. Uh, this neighborhood, all, most of the Jews that lived there moved to upscale neighborhoods in northern Tehran. And so it became a, an overwhelmingly Muslim neighborhood. Uh, but it's still, the Jewish hospital still operates there and still provides uh, good care to everyone. And here we see uh, these are not uh, babies of the Jewish community. Uh, and I think that this is something that, this is something that makes the hospital um even more special um 
during COVID and because of the sanctions on Iran, uh, the hospital um, had to shut down. Um, and just a couple of weeks ago, they announced that they uh, came to an agreement with the Ministry of Health uh, that their debt would be uh, forgiven and they could reopen uh, early next year. Um, this is a matzo factory in, in Iran. Um, there's another story here that uh, about 15 years ago, uh, Chabad, uh, which is a movement with many rights, uh, wanted to do a mitzvah and, uh, and sent uh, hundreds of boxes of matzos to Iran. And the community actually got offended because they have their own matzo factory and, um, and they sent it back. <laughs> um, here we see uh, in the Isfahan Bazaar, uh, a store of uh, a Jewish, um, Jewish owner, he sells rugs. Uh, many of the rugs are for export. Um, so if you get, uh, if you find uh, Persian rugs in, in the local rug store, there's a good chance that it came from this store. Um, this is again, one of, my, one of my favorite photos because I don't know if you can tell here, but after the seder, uh, they turned on the TV to watch the Iranian national team in soccer uh, going on the qualifying uh, game to the World Cup. So <laughs> another one from the Seder. Yeah. Now here we see um, there was uh, the, the community goes on uh, on pilgrimage to holy sites for Judaism, and uh, and here there was a trip to Hamadan. On the way, they stopped in Qom uh, and saw the Khomeini Mausoleum. Uh, and we see here three women from our from the Jewish community uh, looking into Khomeini's living room. And uh, we can only imagine what was going through their mind at the time. On the same trip, they stopped um, for breakfast. And it's a, it's a long drive. Uh, they stopped for breakfast in, in a mosque. And um, breakfast and, and shacharit prayer. And what I love about this photo is that what we see here is the image of Ali, the Imam, uh, the second most important uh, person in, in Shi history. And, uh, and we see the members of the community put on tefillin and, uh, and also have their breakfast. And what you get from this photo or what I get from this photo is the sense of how comfortable they are in that space. It's a mosque, it's a Shi mosque, and yet they don't feel that they are being hosted in the mosque, but they don't feel that this is not a space that, uh, this is not a space that they can enjoy too. This is the, uh, the tomb of uh, Sarah Batasher, um, which over the, the centuries became uh, a site of both uh, Jewish and Muslim women that come to get a uh, blessing for uh, fertility, for wedding, for uh, sickness. And this is, this is a very feminine space and very much shared by Jews and Muslims. And um, I said, I mentioned earlier uh, anti-Semitism, and this is an example. This is a Jewish house in Isfahan, 
And there is a graffiti here. It's, it reads Jude, which is a derogatory term for, uh, for Jew. Um, and we can assume that uh, this was an act of vandalism uh, because the person who did it knew that it's a Jewish, it's a Jewish house. Uh, this is the house of the elderly that uh, that I showed you the the playground uh, in the first image. Um, it reads here in uh, in English, Hebrew, and Persian. Kabed uh, tavicha um, ve'timcha, and um, and this memorial wall. Um, I'm now running through it because I just want to give you glimpses into uh, into many scenes in the Jewish life, and this is a, a gravesite of um, an, a Jewish soldier that died during the Iran-Iraq War. Uh, the Iran-Iraq War was the formative experience of the revolutionary generation, and uh, for many years the Jewish community really wanted to become part of the national story and uh, in recent years we see that they were welcomed into the the story um, you see the flags of the republic on the on the gravesite and this is uh this is not from the from the book but this is a a monument that was unveiled uh, in 2014 in uh, in Tehran, and it's uh, commemorating the memory of the fallen Jewish soldiers from the Iran-Iraq War. Uh, and it reads Shalom on that, Shalom Olam. And before that, the only commemoration for Jewish uh, fallen soldiers was this mural in Tehran, in a very central place, it was a uh, mural commemorating the foreign soldiers from the all the religious minorities, uh, with Khomeini on the top saying, and there's a quote of him saying that uh, the minorities are part of the Iranian nation. Um, ironically, the mural is on the back of a building that was built by the Israeli construction company Solel Bonet that worked very uh, many years in Iran uh, in the 60s and 70s and built uh, the airport, uh, many of the, of the luxury buildings in Tehran, built uh, dams and, and military bases and so on. And with uh, this kid that uh, we know from every synagogue, I, I finish my, <laughs> my talk and, and happy to open the floor for uh, questions. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Can, can I be heard? Yeah. That was absolutely splendid, uh, Lior. And there is so much to try to get a handle on. There have been a couple of people who have written on an issue that it's important you clarify. They have said that relatives of theirs have been silenced or they have been silenced. Again, they didn't really describe what that meant, but you know enough of the scene there to be able to respond to that because that is not at all what you were telling us. Or if there is silence, it's not about everything. It's circumscribed. Iran is not a democratic country. There is no freedom of speech in the way that we understand it, period. However, within that structure, there are people who are in position to uh, to bring to voice the concern to be the voice of the of the Jewish community? Um, there used to be the saying that uh, in Iran uh, you can say anything, but there is a price for that. Um, I I think that today the situation is that you cannot say anything, uh, but you can. Uh, but there's 
it, it's a dance, right? I mean, someone pushes the boundaries and sees how, what kind of response they're getting. And then, but so, and we, it's also something that we can examine by periods. It's not the Republic, the public sphere, the public debate changed quite drastically from 1979 till today. And we can divide it into many uh, mini chronologies. So it, every 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 period is different, and uh, and also there is a profound difference between different administrations. So Ahmadinejad was one thing, but then Rouhani was another thing. Khatami was something, and uh, and we can talk, and Raisi's now. Vice's administration is something completely different, and this is another thing that in the in the in the West, we we tend to ignore the differences between different administrations in Iran as if it doesn't matter. While on many things they share views in terms of negotiating with the West or positions vis-a-vis -vis Israel or the U.S., domestically there are very important differences between the administrations. So there's no freedom of speech. It's not a democracy, but this is exactly why it's important to get our news from reliable sources, because there are movements between, uh, between the two ends of, this, of the spectrum. And what I wanna do, my mission is to, you know, to shed light onto the differences, onto these movements. And I hope that I answered. I'm not trying to. No, it's it's a, trying, yeah, it's a yeah. really complex or and yes, you are shedding light. All right. So there is an, a representative in the parliament, the Majlis, who is Jewish. There is one person, and how is he selected? It's a he, and yeah. I, that comes with the territory there. No. So first of all, there are women members of the Majlis. Uh, there are women members of the majlis, there are women in the government, uh, in minister position, in vice president position. So these are, this is some, but historically, um, the, rep the, rep the Jewish representative in the majlis was always a man. Um, the Iranian constitution, starting 1906, uh, reserved a seat for each recognized minority. Uh, so there is one uh, reserved seat for a Jewish representative, one for Zoroastrian representative, two for Armenians, because there is the Armenians of the north and Armenians of the south, and one for Assyrian. Um, so these are the reserved seats, uh, and they are elected by the Jewish community. So each community elects its own representative in um, so if you think about the electoral map, the Jews all over Iran are considered to be one electoral zone, one electoral district. Okay, so um, men and women vote in this election? Yeah. Representative. And, and yeah. how long does that person remain in that role? Um, there's no... Uh, there's no constitutional term limit, uh, but historically they, they don't serve for more than two or three terms. Okay, and are there any particular issues looking back now, I don't know, the past 10 or 15 years, what the Jewish representative has brought to the attention of the Majlis? So um, the law that I mentioned earlier that exempted right. Jewish students from attending schools, uh, there was another law that, uh, as I as I said earlier in the in the talk, that was discussed um, extensively in the last issue of Ofek Bina is the inheritance law. So until a few years ago, um, if a Jewish person died and they had um, Muslim relatives, the Muslim relative would get all the inheritance on the account of the Jewish surviving uh, family members. Um, the Majlis 
it started under Rouhani. The Majlis uh, corrected, fixed the law to make sure that surviving family members get the shares regardless of their religion. And this is something that was could be done because of very important political work that was done by the representative in the Majlis and the, and the Jewish leadership. Okay. Uh, and there are, there are more laws like that that concern the Jews and and but this, these are the two best examples. Okay. There were several questions about education, okay? So most of the Jewish children attend what we would call government schools, public schools, right? So the questions were asked, who are their teachers? They would be Muslims. Um, and how much of the curriculum concerns uh, Muslim teachings and traditions? And how then are the Jewish children relating to them? So in the religious schools, uh, the teachers are Jewish. Right. Uh, in the public schools, uh, they are mostly Muslims. Um, the, you know, the experience is different between uh one city to another um and you know i i assume that uh in a school where there's one jewish kid uh they would feel very different than school of let's say 20 or 30 or 50 jewish kids um because in tehran in certain neighborhoods there is there are more jewish kids so they feel they can they are not alone, and and the teachers know how to. They know how to, you know, how to interact. Um, in some in some places, um, the Jewish community is a distant memory, um, and if there are very if there are few Jews left, it creates different atmosphere towards the Jews. But in, in places where the Jewish community is still active and visible, um, the school atmosphere is very different. Um, we know that in, in more remote places, I heard from my interviewees and, and uh, collaborators that uh, in remote places, there are, um, there's, prejudice there is um there is some kind of um declarative anti-semitism which i don't hear usually in tehran or in isfahan or shiraz that still have uh you know viable communities okay so many issues to look at in terms of the rabbis in Iran, how are they trained? Uh, some of these people are presumably older, so they they had their rabbinical training earlier, but are there places now where if a young man wants to be a rabbi in Iran, he would be able to study for it in Iran? So yes, there is training for rabbis in Iran, and um, and it's been done, uh, you know, pretty regularly. Um, I'll say that some of the rabbinical students even go to Israel uh, for parts of the training, and to the U.S. and uh, for example, the chief rabbi of Iran today, uh, Rabbi uh, Yehuda Gerami, he he studied in Jerusalem and in New York, um, and he's now in charge of the training of rabbinical students in Iran. So it's uh, th there are many options. <laughs> it's it's uh, amazingly complicated. Okay, there's interest in Jewish authors in Iran. You talked about the uh, periodical. I think it's called Breshit. If I, if I read it. Bina, it was, this was the first, this was the cover of the first issue. Ah. So I showed it. The, the name of the publication is Ofek Bina. Okay, in the beginning. All right. So again, you have many things in your life and you can't spend every single day going through all this material. 
but what are some of the subjects they cover and are Jewish folks writing uh, pieces for the Iranian papers uh, on general issues? H how are their voices heard on, on the radio? Uh, are they newscasters? Talk a little bit about their role in public life. Wow, so this is, uh, you'll have to invite me for another lecture because this is, <laughs> this is, uh, I actually cover some of it in my book and it's really, uh, it's all over the place. I'll say the Tarunia Shayai that I showed, uh, he wrote the article slamming Ahmadinejad for the Holocaust denier, he is actually a film uh, producer. Uh, and he is one of the most successful film producers in Iran. And in 1999, he won a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Iranian film industry. Um, and he's, he's a household name in Iran. Um, historically, there, there, there were Jews in television, in radio, in written uh, in printed uh, media. Um, I'll say that in the in Ofek Bina, I love reading Ofek Bina because you get essays on, um, you know, commentary on Jewish holidays, on Iranian national holidays, um, stories, news from the Jewish communities in Iran. So they bring the stories, not just from Tehran, but also from the more remote places and um, and they bring, uh, you know, to the Iranian readers uh, news from the from the Jewish world outside uh, outside Iran. So there was an essay, for example, on uh, Yudah Menuchin um, that was very interesting. Um, there, there, there's also the political essays. Uh, there was an essay that was printed in three parts over three different issues on history of Zionism, mm. um, history of Zionism in Iran, um, um, sports. So again, it's it's like the New Yorker in the Jewish Tehrani version. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a good deal of interest on the history of the Jewish community in Iran. Uh, we have a question, are people collecting oral histories uh, of people living there? Question about the background of Iran during World War II and the role it played. You alluded to that earlier in, in, in saving lives. And, and how is that being documented and commemorated? So, um, what was the first part of the question? I'm sorry. I was very interested. Let's see. It's Diane, if I if I'm getting this right, or some uh, some. Well, forgive me if it's not. Uh, she asks: Is there an organization collecting oral histories of Jews in Iran um, from those who have left? But uh, again, <laughs> it would be important. Yeah. So there is a center for Iranian Jewish oral history that. Um, stored all the interviews in UCLA uh, Research Library. It's a phenomenal project. They interviewed hundreds of, of people with uh, very interesting personal stories. Um, there's also uh, there are a few other smaller projects uh, of recording uh, oral histories. Uh, one is in Harvard University and one is in Iran today and it's uh, partly online. Um, so yeah, there are many sources to work with. Um, the story of World War II, so Iran in the, and I try to be very brief, Iran uh, was neutral in the first two years of the war. Um, Reza Shah was the father of the last Shah. Um, he pretty much hated all the empires equally. He didn't like Britain, he didn't like uh, the Soviet Union, and he didn't like uh, Germany, but he also wanted to uh, maintain Iran's independence. So he kept, uh, he declared neutrality, 
Um, under this neutrality, there's another story that Iranian diplomat in Paris issued Iranian passports for uh, Jews in Paris between five to 10,000 uh, passports and actually uh, saved them. And in order to uh, perfect the operation, he, he commissioned a research paper that would show that Iranian Jews are actually Aryans and not Semites like the European Jews. <laughs> um, there's a fantastic book on that too. Um, in any case, in June 1941, after Germany attacked uh, the Soviet Union, um, the, the Soviet Union joined the Allied armies and they decided they cannot let uh, Iran's neutrality stand and they uh, invaded, deposed Reza Shah, installed his son Mohammad Reza Shah, and then brought 400,000 Polish refugees that were deported from Poland by the Soviets from the Soviet occupation. Uh, it's a tragic story. Uh, many of them, we're talking about 1.8 million that were deported in 1939 from Poland and two years later, only 800,000 of them survived. Um, and many of them, so 400,000 were sent to India and 400,000 were sent to Iran and they formed the Anders army that joined the, the front in, uh, I think that they made it to uh, North Africa. Uh, Menachem Begin was one of the alums of, uh, of Anders army. And, um, and in that story, they really transformed the Polish refugees had tremendous impact on the Iranian cities. They actually created new, new class of Iranian cities that were very, um, for example, we in most of the Polish refugees were placed in Tehran, Isfahan, and, and, uh, and Ahvaz. And, um, and in those cities, we see uh, Polish orchestras, of uh, philharmonic orchestras, but also jazz clubs. And uh, they start, they opened cabaret theater and uh, and beauty salons for women and, um, and Polish scouts and Polish churches that remained active. Some of them remained active until the 1990s. Um, so these are the kind of, uh, this is the kind of impact that uh, World War II had on, on Iran. We, we don't have too much more time. There was a question about Jewish involvement in the recent protests over the young woman who was uh, not wearing her head covering correctly. Um, were, were Jews particularly prevalent in, in the um, demonstrations or you can't tell? There were Jews in the demonstrations, but unlike 1979, they didn't go to the streets with uh, Jewish banners. Um, in fact, there were five Jews who were arrested during the protest. Uh, they were released shortly after, but we know of five, five Jews who were arrested uh, during the protest. And, um, you know, it's, they are part of the Iranian society. When, they, when Iranians take to the streets, they take to the streets. Yeah, you, you've made, I think, a, a pretty good case for the fact that these are people who see Iran as their home with all its challenges, and they are dispersed in various occupations. They're in the largest cities, but they're also elsewhere. Is there anything you want to say, how to summarize this, you really can't, but points you want to reinforce that perhaps we haven't uh, assimilated quite well enough yet? Um, I know, look, I mean, for me, it's, uh, <laughs> this is what I do for a living. So, um, Iran is a very troubled and complicated place. And we should never take simple answers to explain complicated things. And, um, you know, I, 
I encourage you to to think about Iran in in more nuanced manner. And you know what? I'll end with uh, with a story that I like. Very good. Uh, in 2015, after the nuclear agreement was signed, uh, Steve Inskip from NPR was huh? sent to was sent to Iran. Uh, to report on how the agreement was uh, received in in the proverbial Iranian street, <laughs> and uh, and he spent each morning with another another group, and one morning he went to the Jewish community, and he went to the synagogue that I show the photos of here, Yusuf Abad, and he reported that. There he was in the synagogue during morning service on a weekday. The synagogue was full. And he said that he was the only person that was feeling uncomfortable. He couldn't say why, but he felt very uncomfortable. And then he realized that the reason that he was uncomfortable was that the synagogue was wide open to the street, the doors were wide open. And he said, in New York, you cannot walk into a synagogue without going through security, metal detector. And here I am in the capital of Iran <laughs> and the doors are just open to the street. And I think that this was a very interesting moment. It was very honest moment of like putting ourselves in where we think we are and opening our eyes to what we actually see so i'm not trying to uh, I, I hope that it comes across that i say that it's complicated iran is is not a democracy it's not a liberal place it's not a place that res that has respect to human rights or civil rights but within that, given all that, it's still a place with a living society, with a Jewish community that chooses to be there every day. They can live. They are not. It's not the Soviet Union. They are behind iron wall, uh, iron curtain, and they cannot leave. They travel. They travel to the U.S. They travel to Israel, and they come back. And um, and I want you to you know to remember that. This is, it's a choice that they make. Yeah, I'll, I'll you know, <laughs> I must add one more thing. Yes. There's a beautiful memoir by, uh, by a wonderful author. Her name is Roya Hakakian. She's an Iranian Jewish American uh, novelist, journalist, and her memoir called Journey from the Land of No. Highly recommended. It. It's beautiful. It's so poetic and uh in one part of the book she writes the family dreamed of the land of milk and honey but wanted to wake up in tehran <laughs> and americans can visit iran and americans can be yeah i'm not i'm not in the business of encouraging it but yes <laughs> All right, this has just been remarkably illuminating, Lior. And let's turn to Jerry to see what he wants to say. And I am sure that more questions will arise, and I will transmit them to you if I can. Jerry? Well, okay, I just uh, unmuted myself. Um, sure. It's a complicated place. It reminds me a little bit about four years ago. I, I went to uh, Ukraine, where my father's shtetl is now. I mean, it wasn't in, when he was there, you know, all these borders move around. And then eventually uh, I went to Belarus because I thought my grand my grandparents from my mother's side, I thought came from there, actually one of them did. And when I was in Belarus, this would be way before the Ukraine, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, it was a dictatorship. And we had guides who were from Belarus, they're Jewish, and they, they, kept, they kept saying, well, we can say things, but carefully. We, we can't be very public. And you know, I didn't, I mean, I had a little understanding, but not completely. Since you're saying something similar in Iran, I mean, 
that people can't be very public with 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 things that are against the administration. Not everyone can be public with every statement. There are people that feel that they have more secured position to say things that others cannot. For example, I mean, not, not a Jewish person, but professor in Tehran University, Sadek Zibakalam, uh, one of the smartest people in, in Iran, is a very vocal critic of, of, the, of the government. He keeps talking about uh, Iran's need to reassess its position vis-a-vis -vis Israel, vis-a-vis -vis the US. Um, he became, you know, in the, there was a social media hype a few years ago when uh, there was a video showing him refusing, walking around uh, the flag of Israel not to step on it in the, at the entrance to the university. Um, so he, it was a statement of him refusing to step on the Israeli flag. But he can do it because this is his position. This is his role in the, in the public conversation. And there are Jewish speakers like Harun Yashayai, who is, a, you know, he, as I said, he is a household name in Iran. So he can say things that other Jews cannot say. And for me, the, the, these people, when they speak up, it's important. It's not, it's not, it, it doesn't substitute the silence of others that cannot speak, but it's something. And in, in, some, in some places you don't, you can't even see um, this level of, of opposition or dissent. So this is part of the, of, the, of the game, of the calculation. Until your class, the impressions I had were, well, a number of years ago, there were some very well-publicized executions of Jews accused of being um, Zionist spies, basically. And we know that non-Jews who have gone to Iran because of family relations have often gotten in trouble and been arrested for no reason at all, basically. And we know what's happened now with the, you know, the, the Kurdish uh, uh, young woman who was killed and then the Masamini. because of that and people, you know, this, okay, we hear all these terrible things and I'm sure it's all true, but how much of it is complete or are there other, other things that we don't hear about? We, we don't hear, you, you should assume that you don't hear about most of the things. Um, look, the Islamic Republic was very public with uh, executions following the Masamini uh, protest. Um, this was uh, for domestic uh, reasons and for um, foreign countries. Um, they were completely unapologetic about it because for them the the goal was to suppress the the protest, um, and they succeeded, unfortunately, for many reasons. But one of them was the really brutal um, treatment of, of, the, of the protesters, of the, uh, the speedy executions that people were tried and executed the same day. Um, I mean, but look, I mean, <laughs> there's no, it's not, there's no way to, explain uh, execution, you know, death penalty is barbaric, in my opinion, everywhere that it takes place, especially when it's done as a, as a, as a show, uh, as, a, as sometimes it's, Iran doesn't do it publicly anymore. I mean, it, they, they don't do uh, public executions, but they get publicity to executions that they did recently. Um, in terms of Jewish execution of, of Jewish uh, people, 
I think that the last one was over 20 years ago, um, the last Jew that was executed. And usually the, the accusation of being a spy for Israel is, uh, is, uh, is inf grossly inflated. Um, there were cases of people that uh, traveled to Israel uh, the case of the 13 uh, Jews from Shiraz that were arrested um, in 1999, uh, they were, they traveled to Israel for family occasion and the arrangement is that it's don't ask, don't tell. You don't get stamped on the passport from Israel. Uh, you don't tell anyone that you traveled to Israel and then everything is okay. But uh, in in that case, um, one of the one of the group accidentally said that they were in Israel, so they were arrested. And but all of them were released within weeks. And the long the longest serving the longest sentence was uh, three years in prison. Um, so. Again, there, there are many sensitivities here, and um, yeah, <laughs> I forgot what, where I was going with the answer, but uh, I hope that it answered whatever. Well, the what I had heard, you know, my memory was always of the executions of Jews and of all the horrible things, not related to Jews, but that horrible things in Iran, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, uh, one of the journalists from the Washington Post, he was in prison. Jason Razanyan. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, the Kurds, the Kurds have a terrible time in Iran, in Iraq, in mm -hmm. Turkey. I mean, the Jews have had historically terrible times. The Kurds are, are a situation where the Jews used to be, I think, in, in general. I mean, it's just horrible what you know happens to them. But we hear about and the Baha'i. Baha'is are, are the Baha'is are a different much, story. You know, discriminated and then more than discriminated against. They're 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 um, persecuted, they're, harassed. They they're are harassed. They're, they're you know, it's almost like a Holocaust of the Baha'i. Um, Absolutely. We hear about all these things, and it doesn't make you like the. But, but let me mention one more thing. We haven't talked very much about Israel. Uh, I mean, you have said people can sort of secretly go to Israel and come back and don't, don't ask, don't tell. But I assume that most of the Jewish population in Israel is basically Zionist in the sense that they support a state of Israel, not necessarily the policies of Israel. I've also read that the Iranian people are not really that much anti-Israel. The government is. It, it kind of reminds me a little bit of, of Israel itself, where you have the, the, the Rabium who are dictating all kinds of things. My daughter is Orthodox, very Orthodox, but she can't, she can't stand the Rabium. I mean, it's terrible. And, and I think it may be something like that with the Rabium types. I'm not saying Rabium are will execute people, but but you know, the, the, the extremists who are in charge of the Iranian government, like the Taliban in Afghanistan, I don't think it represents the people of Afghanistan or the people of, of Iran. That's my thought, I don't know. Afghanistan is, a, is, a, is another story and the Taliban is another story. Um, the Iranian public is not, again, I'm trying not to make broad generalizations here, the Iranian public is not very, is not especially anti-Israel. Uh, the government is, of course, and I would say that uh, the, the, the hatred towards the regime is so strong that people start to embrace the regime's enemies as some kind of model. You know, my enemy's enemy is my friend. Um, so all of a sudden we see this kind of um, openness 
in for the lack of a better word towards Israel, the US, uh, the Pahlavi, uh, the Pahlavi dynasty, which was, you know, very much uh, disliked until a few years ago, now get some kind of uh, new energies. Um, not to the extent that Reza Pahlavi thinks, but uh, but there's more there's more romantic. Look, the majority. I think that the number is seventy percent of the Iranian population was born after the revolution. So seventy percent of the population was born into this incredibly difficult place. It changes a lot, and every time, every every time that their hopes are being crashed, either by the regime or by by uh, you know global events or stuff, it it changes the the stance of the people towards the the regime, towards the the regime's goals, and towards uh, the regime's enemies. Um, Well, look, Lior, you're doing really important work, and I think everyone on this call has learned a great deal that they would not otherwise have heard anywhere. So perhaps we can call on you again, maybe <laughs> in another year, and see what's changed. And uh, have a good stay in Munich. And Thank you very much. Safe trip back to the United States. Thank well, you so much. And also, Lior, I mean, it really enlarges our our understanding, which is obviously minuscule, but still, it's it's more than it was, you know, an hour or two ago. And thank you, uh, Mindy, for all the stuff you you've done for this, and also uh, our our new intern, uh, Natanya, who's been helping uh, with the uh, letting people in and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, let me make um, a quick announcement. Uh, two weeks from today, we're having another talk not about the Jews of Iran, but about the Jews of Portugal, and especially about the expulsion of the Jews in 1497 in Portugal, which was an extension of the, of the expulsion from Spain in 1492, and why it happened, how it happened, consequences, all that kind of stuff. That'll be uh, two weeks from today, and then about a month from now, uh, we're gonna have a class on the history of the Jewish uh, Catskills. I'm from the Catskills myself. My parents had a resort hotel in the Catskills. And we're going to have a talk about, about that uh, in, uh, around, I think, July 19th, 20th, if that's what. Um, okay. So, again, thank you. And I hope to see uh, most, uh, most of you in two weeks. Lior, and, good morning. Sleep now, Lior. It's, it's about <laughs> 12 in the morning. You go to sleep. All right. Shalom, shalom. Bye-bye. Good night. <laughs> Bye.